Hey guys, welcome to Miller's Planet. Jay here. Um, have you ever wondered why the fuck this happens? Or how digital watches keep track of time? Or how anyone or anything keeps track of time accurately? Well, today that is what I'm going to be talking about. So what the piezoelectric effect is, the normal and the reverse, and then what makes piezoelectric crystals like quartz so special. I think that's a good starting point, actually. Quartz is a crystalline solid made up of silicon and the oxygen. Uh, what makes quartz so special is the way that the lattice is organized when oriented in a certain way. If you cut one of the crystals diagonally along the z-axis and lay that cross-section flat, it should look something like this. This specific symmetry allows the entire structure to compress. When these atoms compress, the more electrically positive silicon has its average point of charge move upward, and the more electrically negative electron-hungry oxygen has its average point of charge move downward. When you strike one of these crystals, that compression causes surface level changes in overall electric charge on both ends of the surface, and a potential or voltage develops. So that was the regular piezoelectric effect, but it also works in reverse. So if you had a voltage and you applied it across the two terminals, due to electromagnetic attraction and repulsion, the entire lattice would compress. And this makes sense, you know, if we took a screenshot of like a normal piezoelectric effect in a crystal, just like a snapshot of a crystal that just got compressed, and then we look at the reverse piezoelectric effect, their electric and physical properties would be the same. Like their atoms are both doing the same things and are in the same place. Does that make sense? Anyway, both the regular and reverse piezoelectric effects have completely revolutionized the way that we look at time as a society. Like before modern clocks, uh, watches relied on balance wheels and gears and grandfather clocks relied on pendulums. Each full cycle of the pendulum or, or balance wheel told the second hand to move forward by one second. It was obviously wildly inaccurate compared to today's timekeeping standards. Like both watches and pendulum clocks had to be rewound or reset every single day or they would stop working. Pretty much every piece of technology that you can think of that needs to keep track of time uses a crystal oscillator. I'm talking clocks, watches, computers, microwaves, microcontrollers, the atomic clock that pretty much everyone references for accuracy. And there's one commonality between all of those is that they all make use of these specially designed tuning forks. So these tuning forks, they operate on both the regular and reverse version of the piezoelectric effect. When hooked up to an AC power source, each electrode deforms and contracts and the fork vibrates. And they're designed to oscillate at very specific constant frequencies. Like for example, quartz clocks are designed with laser precision and gold plating to oscillate at 32.768 kilohertz. Each oscillation is detected by picking up the fork's change in output voltage. Then it goes through a series of flip-flop logic gates that in a nutshell, turn that 32.768 kilohertz frequency into a one, the one being for one second. Uh, let me explain. A flip-flop logic gate just holds a state at an on or an off position at a one or a zero. Uh, and it runs off of a square wave, so after the oscillator outputs its sine wave, that gets turned into a square wave and then hits the first flip-flop. It's pretty brilliant, actually. Uh, like, let's say we had 15 flip-flops in a row, uh, 15 in series, so the output of one is the input for the next and uh, at each flip-flop, the frequency would cut in half. That thing actually has a name. It's called a 15-stage binary counter. So flip-flop one's state turns into a one, or what's known as the high state. The second flip-flop does not care yet. The first flip-flop changes to a zero or low, and then flip-flop two changes to a one. And then after the second one turns on and off, the third one turns on. This goes on and on down the line until the last flip-flop puts out a one. Then if we're still following the clock example, an electric pulse drives the stepper motor to turn the second hand and gears take care of the rest. That is why, as you might have guessed, the frequency for that clock is so specific because the binary counter uh, cuts the frequency in half 15 times. So if you started out with 32,768 and you divided that in half 15 times, you'd get one. Uh, speaking of logic gates uh, regarding CPUs, You've probably heard of this term, it's called clock speed. Anything that runs programs or uh, a series of logical instructions needs a set point in time and then a pace for all of those subsequent instructions. Like literally a series of zeros and ones packaged up in a square wave that starts and synchronizes all the instructions that take place in a CPU. So they are very good for timekeeping. One use that they have close to my heart is that they're used in microcontrollers like Arduino and Raspberry Pi. I know you can't call an Arduino a microcontroller because it has a microcontroller and a Raspberry Pi is technically a CPU. Let's say that we wanted to use one of those for controlling a motor. 
Like we wanted to turn a fan motor off and on every five minutes. Well, the only way that they're gonna know how long it's been is if their processors are controlled by internal clocks. The higher the frequency, the higher the clock speed, but with faster processing speed comes higher energy consumption and more heat generation. If you have an Arduino, you might've seen this 16 on your quartz resonator. So an Arduino has a clock speed of 16 megahertz and one hertz equals one clock cycle. So that means it runs through 16 million cycles in one second and every instruction takes about one to three clock cycles. Am I overclocking your processor yet? Computer puns. I think I'm gonna end things there. Uh, let me know if you want more of these hardware topics covered. It is a global democracy here on Miller's Planet. Anyway, uh, I would ask you to like this video, but unfortunately, YouTube does not have a like button. All they have is that mean little dislike button. Uh, if you could just email YouTube for me and tell them that you liked this video, or you could you could fax them, obviously. Uh, thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time.